This week on Front Row, Hurricane Matthew hits North Carolina hard. Trump and the GOP establishment go to war, and the candidates for governor and U.S. Senate debate next. Major funding for Front Row is provided by Econ Air, with additional funding provided by Funding for the Lightning Round segment is provided by It's Front Row with host Mark Rotterman. Welcome back to Front Row. Joining us with their insights are Donald Bryson of Americans for Prosperity, Democratic State Representative Ed Haynes, Francis DeLuca of the Civitas Institute, and Donna King, Managing Editor of the North State Journal. Okay, a lot to cover. Let's begin, Donna, by discussing the hurricane. Yes, Hurricane Matthew really uh, left a trail through North Carolina. This weekend, the Tar River is expected to crest on Saturday. Um, Edgecombe County is really in a lot of trouble. Uh, they are, uh, the, the disaster relief has been declared for 17 counties. Um, there's now been 22 deaths due to Hurricane Matthew and flooding, mostly people going around barriers and driving through flooded waters. And um, most of the fatalities have been in North Carolina from Hurricane Not Matthew. Not listening to the governor's warnings? Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of warnings from, from the governor. He's been out uh, throughout eastern North Carolina helping where he can. And uh, emergency assistance for replacement food for people who are on uh, food assistance. They've been, they've qualified to get their food replaced. Uh, unemployment insurance, he's... Uh, he's declared an emergency for that for people who need unemployment insurance. This is really hitting eastern North Carolina hard. They're saying now that we could look, be looking at about $70 million in damage just to North Carolina, $10 billion across the East Coast. Francis, you were in public safety. What does it take to prepare for a disaster like this? It's or can a, you prepare? No, you can't prepare, and they've shown they are prepared. That's been one of the <clears throat> things that has been most uh, apparent is that the state emergency response was ready to go. They've gone. They've been the places they need to be. And, and the, the, the geographic scope of this is huge. And, and yet they've been responding around the state simultaneously. And that's really what emergency response is about. It's being prepared, having the systems in place, having the chain of command, and having the logistics um, out, spread out throughout the state and able to respond. And they've done a good job. It it's really a military exercise almost, isn't it? It's a military exercise. It's having the right people in place. The governor apparently has a good person running um, emergency response. Public safety is part of that. National Guard, state uh, highway patrol, uh, you know, working together and with the local Well, you people. were involved with Hugo, right? At some yeah. point? When Hugo happened while I was at public How safety. How would you compare this to Hugo? Oh, it, there's no comparison. In Hugo, it was a it went through and was gone. There was not the sustained flooding. It was a cleanup operation. This is an ongoing reaction because the rivers are rising, so you constantly have to be responding to a new emergency as you're cleaning up the old emergency. Ed, do we have the reserves to cover this, or do we need a legislative session, a special legislative session, do you think? Yeah, you know, you hate to see this turn into uh, what it's turning into now, and it seems like there's a little bit of political banter going on about this, you know, legislative session. I think certainly uh, I, I would stand with Senator Blue and with the uh, uh, minority leader, Larry Hall, on our side to, to call for a legislative session, uh, and I would hope that we would be doing this for the right reasons. I would hope that the pushback that we're getting is also for the right reasons. They're saying we had a reserve to do it, but uh, you hate to see it turn political, but certainly it looks that way. Donald, do, do we have the reserves? Do we need a special legislative session, do you think? Uh, I think we have the reserves right now. Uh, I think that there is hesitancy to call a special session because, as, as Francis said, it's still an ongoing operation. Rivers haven't fully crested yet. We can The legislature can come in session and allocate money, but to what? We don't know what we're cleaning up yet because it's not over yet. And so uh, there's no reason to allocate money until you know how much you need to spend. Do, do we know what the we know what the uh, impact to human beings is? Do we know what the the long term uh, economic impact will be? Well, I mean, uh, let me let me say to your point that you know the economic impact or the impact to human beings uh, with you know 22 people in North Carolina, more than a thousand people if you include all the states plus the island nations that hit died, uh, doesn't compare to the economic impact. But they're looking at about 10 billion dollars in property damage in the United States. Uh, insurance companies are going to be liable for about six to eight billion of that. I know. Uh, uh, Ag uh, Commissioner Troxler has said that it's about $2 million loss to the poultry industry right now, which actually isn't that bad compared to what they thought it might be. Any final thoughts? 
I think um, I've been impressed, actually, with the way that this has um, been organized and run. I think that the limited mobility for some of the central part of the state uh, to get to the east has been impressive. You know, I think that they've um, had the right resources in the right time, and I think it says a lot about our National Guard. Really quickly, talent. around the horn, how has the yeah. governor handled this? What grade would you give him? I give quickly. Him, I give him an A+. Plus. A. A plus. Francis. A. So, Alwyn, so you're ready to support him now on his leadership. <laughs> is that right? You're changing, you're changing horses now? No, not quite. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Of course, this week, uh, Donald, we saw Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, and Donald Trump go, go to war. What was the genesis of, the, of, of that uh, dust up? Well, I mean, it was the accident. Well, it, it had been an ongoing thing. Uh, Poor Speaker Ryan, I'd say poor Speaker Ryan with a lot of sympathy. Since he had endorsed Donald Trump, it was almost a weekly thing that he had had to come back and apologize or, uh, you know, call out Donald Trump for something he had said or something he had done in the past. And I think that the nexus of this latest thing is the Access Hollywood tape. And finally, uh, Speaker Ryan has said that he's not going to defend it anymore. He's not going to apologize for Trump anymore. And he's going to focus on down ballot races. And Donald Trump just doesn't care for that very much. D Donald, let me ask you a question. Is this more about policy? Is this more about trade? Is this mo more about the direction of the, uh, of the Republican Party? Uh, or is, is it more because these guys just really don't like each other? I think it's a personality. I think it's, it, it, it comes down to a personality. We have seen so little policy in this election, it's been amazing. Even the debates have been, you know, 10 minutes out of a out of a 90-minute debate is spent on policy. So I really do think that this is a, a you know Ryan is a policy wonk. But do you think Francis he's positioning himself to run for president? I don't. I'm talking about Ryan. Uh, Four years from now. I don't know if he's doing that or positioning himself that he thinks he's defending his uh, Republican majority in the House. But overall, for the Republican leadership, I think they should remember what St. Augustine said about hate the sin but love the sinner, which is not how they're approaching these latest revelations. Well, you know, I think he's got some blowback, uh, Donald, from, from a lot of Republicans, particularly in the grassroots, for going after Trump. I, I hate to see, you know, if I was, you know, I put on my partisan hat, but I, I hate to see that in the last stages of a campaign, a split like this. I mean, but the split, the split exists not because people love Donald Trump so much, it's because they hate Hillary Clinton so much. And so uh, it, what Paul Ryan is seeing, in, in my view, is that he's just trying to preserve his majority and try to figure out how to pick up the party and move on from what he perceives as an inevitable Republican loss at the presidential part of the ticket. And Donald Trump perceives this to be, you know, people just being disloyal to the party. Mark, I tell you, I'd I, I, I love to see the split like this is going on right now uh, in, the Trump, in the Trump campaign. And I think a lot of what we're seeing, uh, quite frankly, are, are folks who uh, know they have a flawed candidate, have known it, you know, for some time and have tried to be good soldiers along the way to stay with the party. But I just think the, uh, Mr. Trump has done so many things over the last three or four weeks to kind of get in front of himself uh, when he could have just uh, allowed the natural news cycle and some of the bad news that came out about the secretary to really lead the way. About Clinton. About, that's exactly right. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't do it. And so now, you know, you're certainly having this split out there uh, that we're seeing, uh, you know, cause some more ripples, which is... But realistically, your team doesn't think he can take back the U.S. House, do you? Uh, I think we, we, we are hoping that he continues to keep talking. More videos come out, and we're going to keep moving down that direction. I, I, think be the Senate, I think the Senate is in play, but I do not mm -hmm. think that, that there, there's just enough time to change, because, particularly because of the makeup of the districts. Don't you agree with that, Francis? Um, I think on the, on the House side, yes. I think on the Senate side, if Republicans lose the Senate, they might trace it back to the people who condemned Trump after this and lose his, the mm. down-ballot votes from those people. I think there could be some blowback Well, on right that. now, are you seeing any down-ballot uh, backwash? Do I mean, you think Burr's in pretty good shape? Or, 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 or top of the ballot, McCoy, are, are they being affected by Trump? Statewide, Burr is probably in the best shape um, of any Republican, and I think all the Republicans, and it's it's close races across the whole top of the ballot in North Carolina, and I don't we don't see any uh, blowback from Trump. We don't see any down ballot drop off from Trump. And, and, and frankly, he's still doing. He's what tied with independents now. Still, uh, last poll we had him ahead on independents, but we have we're in the field right now. So, I want to move on. We had a very spirited debate between uh, Attorney General Cooper and uh, Governor McCoy for the, for the governor's race. Your takeaways, Ed. 
very spirited, uh, policy-driven debate. Uh, I thought both candidates hit the uh, measure the way that they probably needed to. I thought uh, the attorney general was measured and stoic in his in his, uh, in his in his responses and, and movement through the debate. I thought, frankly, the governor was uh, frankly uh, unflappable in terms of uh, his questioning, uh, in terms of his response. It was it was very interesting to hear his responses, and frankly, the governor's doubling down again on HB two, which again uh, I, I think is something that only works to benefit Democrats. Uh, but at the but at the same time, I thought his uh, response with regard to business was uh, was very good. I thought uh, our uh, AG's response and attacks on education were also solid. Uh, I, I thought both candidates did, frankly, what they needed to do. I I've watched McCory for years, Francis. I thought this was the best debate I've seen. I saw him in 08, and he was a little unpolished, but I, I think he's really grown in the job. And, and uh, look, there was a lot of talk about teacher pay in, 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 in this. What's the real story on teacher pay? There was a back and forth. And there's a lot of advertising going on with this. And then I want you to jump into it as well, Donald. But there was a lot of, uh, lot of talk about teacher pay and the rankings. What is the real story? Are we making progress or is this just, a, are we just, you know, treading water? Well, this is always, people can argue about it, but the facts on the ground, and you may disagree, but they've actually increased teacher pay over the last several years. There's no disputing that uh, teacher pay has gone up. It's always going to be an average. It's always going to include local supplements. That's been the history of it. That's going to continue to be the future of it. But teacher pay in North Carolina has gone up, and it's going to continue to go up as teachers um, get more experience because their pay goes up with years. Donald, do you agree with that? No, it definitely has gone up. Nobody disputes that. Uh, the way that the Cooper campaign is trying to spin it is that we've fallen to 41st. Well, no, we, we fell to 46th first under Purdue and Easley, and then we've gotten back to 41st. Now, admittedly, we were higher up in the rankings when uh, Roy Cooper was uh, Senate Majority Leader, but, you know, he sat there as AG and supported a bunch of governors that let it drop to 46th. Well, well let me ask you, Ed, is, 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 is uh, Attorney General Cooper's uh, advertising disingenuous on this issue? No, I wouldn't say it's disingenuous. I, I, would, I would say this is, this is the silly season. This is politics time, and so so when people talk about teacher pay, uh, there's no there's no question that salaries have the salaries have risen. Uh, the question becomes how we describe those salaries, and so I think if there's anything disingenuous uh, out there, it, it's it's the it's the governor uh, and his campaign uh, insisting or suggesting that some way teachers are all making fifty thousand dollars a year, and that's certainly not the case. That's uh, a great so, line, right? Uh, it certainly it certainly <laughs> uh, it certainly plays well out there in the street. But I think people know the truth. Donna, you want to jump in on this? I do actually. I think that some of this debate and all of this politicizing teacher pay has really hurt what's really important, and that's the students, because uh, enrollment in education programs at universities is down 30 percent. Um, millennials aren't seeing teaching as a career track, and that's something we've got to do something about. We've got to create places and opportunities for teachers to make more, writing curriculum, training other teachers, things that yes, they can stay do. in the classroom. We also had a very heated debate, uh, Donna, on the SBI mm -hmm. crime labs. Who's winning that issue, and what was your takeaway uh, with the uh, inner uh, back and forth between Cooper and, and McCoy. Sure, I think well, whenever you see problems with the SBI crime lab, it, it is not a good reflection of the person who's in charge of the whole thing in, in, in the Attorney General Cooper who's been there for 15 years. And there's no getting around that. And when you talk to, you know, locals and it takes two years to process a rape kit, um, you know, it, it is a problem. And it's a huge problem. It's been a problem for a long time and it's something that's not been tackled in 15 years. And I do think that probably McCrory comes out ahead on that issue. But I also think that this debate this week caught him at a time where he is, you know, being the governor. He's leading the state and he was comfortable behind the podium. Francis, is HB2 still the overshadowing the whole governor's race? And I know that uh, my friend Ed is going to want to jump in on that. HB what? I haven't really heard other than other than other than other than one or two debates over the last two weeks. I haven't heard a mention of that in the last several weeks in the news cycle because we've had really important things that we're worried about, like hurricanes. Uh, we're There's talking about a lot about of discussion the in, the, in the governor's debate about right. that, though, right? But it, without the governor's debate and the few hundred thousand who watched that, HB two has not been in the news cycle for several for two weeks. Mark, what was shocking to me is, again, the doubling down on this failing position that uh, the governor has taken with regard to HB2 and having, and then the next night seeing United States Senator Burr 
uh, make an incredibly great and reasoned response to the HB2 bill that I thought, well, well why on earth haven't the two of them been talking and why hasn't the governor you know, taken his stance with regard to how he has approached this from a political standpoint? Uh, I, I still think it's going to be a driving force. Well, that's a great segue. Let's go right into the one and only Senate debate that we had last night. Any game changers, Francis? No, debates, unless someone really messes up, don't change it. What I would say about the debate last night was I was disappointed in Deborah Ross. Mm. I was expecting her to be quick on her feet, to be uh, responding to the questions, not to use rehearsed talking points. And, and I've seen her. She is good. That was not, she was not good last night. And I think that was my big surprise out of the debate. The rehearsed talking points that she kept coming back with, you know, basically reciting talking points instead of answering Donna, the question. Donna, you concur with that assessment? I would, actually. I was surprised. I've seen her on the floor, and she's she's usually a very strong debater. Um, I thought it was a somewhat disappointing performance, but I did see those talking points coming over and over again. We saw it in the cooper uh, McCrory debate, but we also saw it in Ross Burr. And, um, but it's hard to compete with uh, Burr's years of experience doing that. But what this. was her best moment? Do you think Deborah Ross's best moment? Can you pick out one for us? You know, I, I think that she... Um, I can't actually. <laughs> I'm having a hard one on that. But I, you know, I do think that she um, really focused in, and that some of this is the moderator's fault on Trump. Uh, she focused in on Trump, burst support of Trump, and I think that that's a loss for North Carolinians who really need to hear about policy and what she's going to do as a senator. Donald, what were your takeaways on the debate? Uh, I thought uh, Senator Burr was actually very polished. He had clearly been very, very prepped. Uh, the, the key moment of the debate to me was when they had asked about how his net worth had increased while he'd been in office, which it has, and he admitted to that, but it was the fact that his wife had started a real estate company. And uh, I think his explanation was that she's now like 66% of their net worth altogether. And he sort of asked Deborah Ross for an apology of like, why are you shaming my wife for making money? I, I thought it was uh, a very well-controlled moment for the senator. Well, she brought up Obamacare. How did you think she, that, that was handled by, by Deborah Ross? Uh, I, I think she did the best that she could with it. I mean, certainly there are some issues that are going to have to be worked through. My, my answer would have just been yes and moved on <laughs> when, when they asked, you know, would I support it? Yes, I would have supported it. But I think, you know, the overarching issue is this. It is very difficult to overcome 22 years of experience, and especially in a closed, controlled environment like you had uh, last night. Um, I thought she did a fine job. I think, was it, was it evident that there was one person on the stage who had been doing it for 22 years and was used to the questioning, had, you know, had really, you know, strong, if not necessarily all the way agreeable, foreign policy, you know, statements? Yes, I think that was clear. But I also think we had a, we have two good candidates and, and our Democratic candidate, I think, for the first time, well, I did fine. I mean, do you think she was well-versed on, on national security or did she, she was a little tentative I there? think it's very difficult, I think it's very difficult to compare, you know, one as smart as, as, as Deborah, who's obviously well-studied and, and well-versed and, and and a, and a number of things to someone who does foreign policy all day, every day, and has been doing it you know, for, for a number of years. It's just a tough comparison. You know, I actually thought at, at, at the first that, that Burr was a little tentative until he got into a rhythm, but when they got into areas that he knew, he was, I thought he, he, he was reticent to attack a woman, which I think was smart. Let's just go around the horn. Who won that debate, you think, Donald? I, I think Richard Burr won that debate. I think Ed, Richard Burr won the debate. Burr. 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 You know, there's hope for you yet, Ed. But I, Listen. I will, I will <laughs> both, both the gubernatorial debate and the Senate debate had much, much more substance than the presidential debate or any presidential debate we've seen. Yeah. And much more civil. And but, much more absolutely. civil. Well, let's go into the most underreported story of the week. Donald, what's your most underreported story? The uh, Democratic senator, uh, or not senator, but governor of the state of Minnesota has come out and said that the Affordable Care Act is now unaffordable. Uh, it doesn't really help people in his state. Mark he thinks, Dayton. Yeah, Mark Dayton is saying mm -hmm. that it's just too pricey for people, and he's asking the Minnesota legislature to come in with price controls in the state exchange up there. So, so do you think that, that in 2017, uh, this is whoever's the next president is going to have to? This is going to be a crisis. I think it's going to be a crisis, and I think that's why the U.S. Senate is actually all the more important because there's a debate there right now. How do we fix? Uh, Obamacare and the Senate Democrats are pushing for a single payer option and the Senate Republicans are pushing for more, you know, free market and price, uh, you know, uh, 
Ed, you want to weigh yeah. in a little bit? I lost my train of thoughts. So. Uh, yeah, my my most underreported story is actually one that's been reported, and it's obviously the Matthews, uh, the, uh, the Hurricane Matthew Hurricane. But there's a sub story of that, and it's happening in Lumberton on the south side of Lumberton, mm -hmm. where the poorest of the poor people uh, down there living. I have a fraternity brother, Anthony Brady uh, Brady, who is from down there, who is back on the scene from Washington D.C. to came down to get his family out, and he tells me that there are Katrina-type conditions down there, the people are literally without any type of resources whatsoever. And uh, he is down there working with several of our frat brothers uh, to, to, to help these folks. And so this is something that's happening right here in North Carolina. We have to make sure that we're responding uh, where we can to help these folks out. So uh, what big are, up to Anthony. Are 31 Brown. counties now that are, that are disaster areas? I believe so. So the president has responded and declared them to disaster areas, Absolutely. correct? So we can expect some funds from, from the uh, and, and, and U.S. We government. Need it, we need it quickly, especially down there. We need it quickly. Francis, the most underreported story? Well, again, the national story, this is the um, FBI agents who were involved in investigating the email scandal have started to talk to the press in, you know, behind the scenes, but talking about how they recommended an indictment and that the Comey and the Justice Department, and they feel the White House overruled them and that their, their wishes and recommendations were ignored. You're not seeing anything about that on the nightly news at all. No, and you probably won't. Yeah, I, I do think that, that Trump has somewhat of a point there to just pile on at this point. Uh, let me ask you, what's the most underreported story, Donna? Surprisingly enough, the WikiLeaks. I am really surprised it has not gotten the coverage. We've had lots of floods and debates and campaign, but this WikiLeaks thing is a big deal. Uh, we're seeing John Podesta, who has been a part of the um, the Democratic machine at the national level for, you know, as long as Clinton's been around. Um, his emails were leaked, and in them were criticisms of uh, people of faith, of, uh, you know, Catholics, of Miss America, of, you know, Hispanics. the Hispanics, needy Hispanics, as I think is what you called Mr. Richardson. It's, um, it's damaging, and we're not seeing anything. We're not seeing it on any of the nightly news, um, and we have that, but we also have this uh, undercurrent that maybe we may have suspected that the New York well, Times and a few other news outlets are Not feeding. to interrupt, but do you sure. think Trump is stepping on this story by some of the things he's doing? I think that is likely. I think it would probably, it would, you know, if you let the news cycle uh, do what it will, it would probably um, pop to the top of the headlines, but we're just not seeing it. I'm going to move to lightning round. Who's up and who's down? I think Governor McCrory is up in North Carolina. I think he's having a good week. Uh, unfortunately, it comes with Hurricane Matthew, but he also had a really good debate. I think down is probably Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, there's just no way to get around the Access Hollywood tape, and he's taking a hit for it. Yeah, and then, then with the other women coming out, whether it's true or not, it plays into the story, correct? That's right. Who's up and who's down, Ed? Up, North Carolina po politicians. We had national-level moderators in town, substantive debates, policy-driven, mostly respectful. Our politicians are up. Uh, down, John Stump, Wells Fargo CEO, finally... <laughs> You know, finally steps right down, thing. finally steps down, uh, says he won't take his $2.9 million salary this year, but he did get paid $19 million last year, largely on the fraud that he committed against the uh, citizens and the customs at his bank, so he's down. I thought both, uh, you were talking about the, the debates, I thought both moderators did a fairly good job. I thought Chuck Todd did a very good job. Did a very job, good don't job. You? Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, and I'm going to steal yours. I, w I had a different one. I was going to say the government, <laughs> but I have to say uh, North Carolina politics because both debates were substantive in civil, um, down eastern North Carolina towns, especially the small towns. This is, I come from eastern North Carolina, a lot of these small towns are going to have a hard time recovering, and it, it is, is going to be a long time. Francis, do you think that's getting enough play on the national news? Because, you know, I mean, I really don't think that people understand how hard Matthew hit us. Yeah. It's... You know, but in the big scheme of things, for the rest of the nation, it's not really that important. I hate to set, sound uh, callous, but it's just not that important in the big scheme. We're talking small towns of two, three, maybe 15,000 people that will have a hard time recovering from this, even with state and federal help. Yep. Donna, who's up and who's down? I think this has been Pat McCrory's week. He uh, has really shown that it takes more than a press release and a commercial to be governor. He's, he's you know, been out there in floodwaters helping people in Edgecombe County and, and doing what we can in Lumberton, leading the group, um, you know, two or three appearances a day, making sure that the media knows what's going on, they can get help where it needs to be. Um, it's been a proactive week for him. Showing leadership. Showing some real leadership and, and doing a debate, which, you know, I'm surprised they really did it that week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a big week. So he showed some leadership behind the podium, but then also out in the field. 
Who's down? I think down, I was really surprised with Deborah Ross. I really was surprised. I've seen her her at her on the floor there. She's she's usually very much better than she showed uh, in our in our debates on Thursday. Candidly, I was a little surprised too because I'd heard so many mm -hmm. good things about her, but had not seen her in action. Okay, what's the headline next week, Donald? I think uh, waters recede and we see the actual impact of Hurricane Matthew. What's the headline next week? Early voted extended due to destruction of Matthew in your dreams, Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't think it's going to happen? You I don't think they're going to do it. I think you're just a pessimist, really. I want them to do it. <laughs> What's the headline next well, I week? Got, I got two, but um, one's going to be uh, we're going to be filing a lawsuit against the Department of Justice and the Attorney General, so stay tuned for that. Here in North Carolina? Here in North Carolina. Civitas Institute? Yes, that's Center for Law and Freedom. And the other is I should be a grandfather again by this hey, time next week. That's exciting. Wow. What's um, the headline I, next I week? think we're going to still be seeing a lot of Matthew, but I think the big one is we're going to have record early voting turnout, I think, uh, just with the... Who does that accrue to? What candidate then, do you think? I think it's going to be um, just that there's been so much more of a spotlight on North Carolina's early voting, and I think we're going to have people coming out uh, early and, and quickly. Do you think the media has just called this race too early? I think that is probably true, but, but I also think that you know, the media is being driven by a, a very few people at the top level, and we're not seeing it filtered down, and I'm not sure how much people are really taking Francis, you know, has the mainstream media already called the presidential race, do you think? No, because it's to their benefit not to call it yet. I think we'll see Trump come back. I think this race is going to still have a few more ups and downs before election Quickly, day. Quickly, have they called the race? Uh, I don't think they've called the race quite yet, but we have to watch the trend lines. I think three, three and a half weeks is an eternity in politics, so we have to keep it. Have they called watching. the race already? They really, really want to, but they, yeah, it's to their benefit to not do it, and I don't think you can because it's so tumultuous, and it's not about policy. It's so about October 19th, that debate looms large. I mean, that could be uh, the closer for both to make the last sale, correct? Right. You know, I, and I also think the turnout mechanism is, uh, for, for Hillary is not what they really th think it is. Don't you agree with that? I agree. We've been tracking some numbers that show their registration efforts are not anywhere close to 12 or especially not close to 8. So that is an indicator. This was a great conversation. Look forward to seeing you next week on Front Row. Major funding for Front Row is provided by Econ Air with additional funding provided by Funding for the Lightning Round segment is provided by It's Front Row with host Mark Waterman. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.